on all of television. When I came up from the landing of the stairs, um, my boyfriend had Aiden in his hands, uh, where he had just um, got him from under his father that had fallen on him after he was shot. Tonight, new heartbreaking stories from the shooting at a 4th of July parade in Highland Park, Illinois. A little boy orphaned during a day out with his parents. His mom and dad shot to death. His father shielding him from the gunfire. Strangers able to rescue the two-year-old from the scene. Our Stephanie Ramos speaks with families there. The accused parade shooter in court today showing no emotion. Prosecutors say he confessed to opening fire on the crowd, dressing up like a woman so no one would recognize him, and was even planning another attack that same day a state away. The alleged killer facing seven counts of murder now, and prosecutors are saying more charges are coming. ABC's Alex Perez has the latest from Highland Park. A major witness to testify to the January 6th committee. Former President Trump's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, will talk behind closed doors at the end of the week after public pressure and then a subpoena. What to expect from Cipollone, who was witness inside the West Wing as the insurrection was unfolding at the U.S. Capitol. A major error by a major U.S. city that resulted in thousands of foreclosures, forcing thousands out of their homes. Why the city says even though it made a mistake, can't pay those people back. Do you think if it had been properly valued, you would have been able to afford to stay in there? It have either been something affordable, something I could have borrowed, something I could have negotiated, something feasible. Safeguarding a species, ABC News Live takes you to South Africa for a closer look at how a foundation is saving rhinos and rebuilding the population in a protected place. And the comedian shattering glass ceilings by becoming the first Latina to create, produce, and star in her own network sitcom on ABC. My conversation with Cristela Alonzo as she launches her stand-up special, Middle Classy. You know, to me, I think that as I get older, I realize that uh, the obstacles and sacrifices, the struggles that I've had growing up, really make you who you are. Good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff, in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with new details about that mass shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, and the suspect charged with seven counts now of murder in the 4th of July parade massacre. The 21-year-old appeared in court today showing little emotion as the names of the victims were read aloud. State attorney says he has confessed to opening fire on the crowd. Authorities saying he used a semi-automatic rifle to fire more than 80 rounds from a rooftop overlooking the parade route. And officials revealed today that the alleged gunman was considering a second attack that day in neighboring Wisconsin following his escape from the parade scene. There is still no clear motive for the attack, but despite the suspect's troubling past, including a prior suicide attempt and threats to harm his own family, he was able to legally purchase the weapons used in the attack, an attack that has left so many lives and a community shattered. We begin tonight with Alex Perez in Highland Park, Illinois. Today, before a judge, accused 4th of July killer Robert Cremo denied bail. Prosecutors say he has confessed to the horrific crime. His statement was voluntary. He went into details about what he had done. Uh, he admitted to what he had done. They say Cremo, dressed in women's clothes, covered his distinctive facial tattoos with makeup and climbed a fire escape to the perch where he used an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle to rain down terror on his innocent victims. Amid the chaos, police say Cremo fled to neighboring Wisconsin, where they say he considered launching a second attack there on a celebration he drove by. It appears when he drove to Madison, he did see a celebration that was occurring in Madison, uh, and he seriously contemplated using the firearm he had in his vehicle to commit another shooting. Do you know how much ammunition he had at that point? On uh, his approximately 60 rounds. But according to police, Cremo abandoned the idea, believing he didn't have time to plan it. <laughs> Investigators have determined he spent weeks mapping out the attack on the parade in Highland Park, but his motive still a mystery. His motivation isn't uh, necessarily clear. However, he uh, had some type of affinity towards the number four and seven, and inverse was seven four. Seven four, July 4th. What authorities say they do know is that Cremo was armed to the teeth. 
And tonight, they are grappling with serious questions about how he was able to obtain his weapons legally, given a series of red flags over the years. Police called to his home twice in 2019, once after they say he attempted suicide, and again five months later after they say he threatened to kill his family, authorities confiscating a stash of more than a dozen knives, a dagger, and a sword. But none of that stopped Cremo from passing multiple background checks to legally purchasing a total of five firearms. For most of those purchases, he was under 21, which means he needed a parent to sign off on his firearm owner's ID, and state police say that's exactly what his father did. Police say authorities said they had insufficient basis to deny the application. Alex Perez joins us now from Highland Park. Alex, lots of questions tonight about the father, and tonight the Illinois State Police say they're looking into it. Yeah, Phil, state police here say they have launched a criminal investigation to determine if the suspect's father could be held culpable. Now, in a statement, the attorney for Cremo's parents is saying in part, quote, none of us know exactly what's going on with our children all of the time. This family was no different. Phil? All right, Alex Perez, thank you. And heartbreaking stories continue to emerge about some of the seven victims killed in that 4th of July massacre, including the parents of a two-year-old boy. His father was killed as he shielded his son from a barrage of bullets. The boy was rescued by strangers. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, as the close-knit community of Highland Park mourns and plans funerals for the seven killed on the 4th of July, we're learning more about the people who lost their lives and how strangers came together in the chaos to help a little boy. In the aftermath of the shooting, Dana and Gregory Ring, sheltering in a parking garage, approached by a woman covered in blood. She was carrying a child who was also covered in blood, and it quickly became apparent the child was not her own. That child was two-year-old Aiden McCarthy. Aiden's parents, Kevin and Arena McCarthy, did not survive. That woman who found Aiden underneath his dying father was Lauren Silva. He had blood on his legs. He had a sock that was fully covered in blood that I wanted off of him. Um, he had one shoe on. What was Aiden like? Uh, Aiden, when I took Aiden down to the garage, um, he wasn't crying. He just kept saying, is mama dad okay? Um, and it was hard to, to look at him in the face and say it's going to be okay when I didn't know if it was. Lauren gave Aiden to the rings, who brought Aiden to police. I pulled up and I said, this is not our kid. It's not his blood. He's okay. What should we do? And a cop said, we can't be babysitters now. Can you take care of him? We said, of course. Tonight, Aiden is safe with his grandparents. The Rings, thankful they were able to help Aiden and Lauren. She's, she's a real hero. She's a hero. She got him she, out of the immediate danger. It's a time when strangers come together and you just, you just do, you just act. And um, they were doing the same thing that I was doing. It is such a gut-wrenching story. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, what's next for these families and the new reality they now face? Well, there have been a number of prayer vigils and memorials for the victims, but now families are planning their funerals. Uh, we know that the first is set for this Friday for Jackie Sundheim. She was a loyal member of her synagogue, and they tell us that she will be missed dearly. Phil. Absolutely. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. Now on to the January 6th committee and new developments on a major witness. Former President Trump's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, will now testify under subpoena on Friday, meeting with the panel behind closed doors. He is a critical witness who was with the president in the West Wing as the attack on the U.S. Capitol unfolded. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. He was the top lawyer in the Trump White House, one of the few people around the former president as the insurrection unfolded. And tonight, Pat Cipollone has agreed to testify before the House committee investigating the riot. Our committee is certain that Donald Trump does not want Mr. Cipollone to testify here. But we think the American people deserve to hear from Mr. Cipollone personally. Faced with a congressional subpoena and weeks of public pressure, Cipollone has agreed to a videotaped, transcribed interview with the committee behind closed doors on Friday. Several witnesses already describing his actions that fateful day, including former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson, who said Cipollone tried to stop the president from going to the Capitol and was angry when former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows appeared to do nothing as rioters chanted, Hang Mike Pence. 
I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. To which Pat said something, this is effing crazy. Phil, sources tell us Cipollone's testimony could be limited due to attorney-client privilege. But the committee is all but certain to use video from his taped interview in his final hearings set to take place next week. Phil? Our thanks to Pierre for that. Lawmakers have suggested that Cipollone is the missing link, as they've said in their investigation. Former federal prosecutor and ABC News contributor Khan Naude joins me now to discuss the importance of this testimony. Khan, thanks for, for joining us in studio. Um, this is a fascinating conversation because last week we were all talking about Cassidy Hutchinson and a lot of lawmakers were saying, this is it, this is the missing link. But this is White House counsel. This is the guy who Cassidy Hutchinson said, if we go up to the, if, don't let him go up there because if he goes up there, we could be charged with all these crimes. Do you expect him to come in and corroborate or refute this stuff? I, I think he's gonna come in and testify. I don't think he's gonna assert any privileges. Um, and I, I think we'll see if he corroborates what Cassidy Hutchinson had said. Uh, he was involved in a lot of things that she uh, spoke about and it, it's gonna be riveting. I, I think it's going to be potentially uber explosive again, right? Because right now we've had Cassidy Hutchinson, who said a lot of explosive things. And what Cipollone can potentially do is corroborate everything she said. And, you know, th there's a saying as a prosecutor in a prosecutor's office is that if you have one witness, well, that's a triable case. Maybe right. the defendant goes to trial, right? If you have two, uh, maybe the defendant shouldn't go to trial. So I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how much he match, his testimony matches with Cassie. Well, it's all about cooperation, right? How important is it that the January 6th committee gets cooperation on what she said? Because we saw Cassidy Hutchinson talk about uh, former president lunging toward the steering wheel. Much has been made of that. But that was a hearsay conversation. She even said that. Someone told me that. A lot of the explosive things that you're talking about have not been refuted by anybody that he wanted to go up to the Capitol. And Pat Cipollone is going to have to come in there and talk about that. How important is it for the January 6th committee and then, say, the, the DOJ to get cooperation? I think it's vitally important. That's what they're trying to do with each of these hearings, with each of these witnesses. They're trying to bolster each witness up by saying, hey, look, the meeting in the Oval Office with Jeffrey Clark, you've got Barr there, you've got Donahue there. And supposedly you had Cipollone there, too. So Cipollone can say, Potentially, hey, that's exactly what happened. I said that this whole thing with the Georgia legislature was a murder-suicide pact. I said that. And then how can you refute that? Yeah, I mean, he's really in on everything here. When it comes to any president, White House counsel gets no closer to anything that someone is saying that president might have done wrong, right? Because everything is usually run by White House counsel. That's the way it works, right? Exactly. And that's why he's important. I mean, Cassidy Hutchinson was important. We didn't even know who she was, really, a couple weeks ago. But then we realized, wait a second, this is a person in the room, close to the president, close to conversations about the president for all these events. And now you have Pat Cipollone, who, as you said, he's the White House counsel. I'd be interested in hearing about things we haven't heard about, mm. key moments. Like we're all talking like about- what? Who knows, <laughs> right? We didn't know about a lot of these things right. a couple weeks ago that Cassidy Hutchinson brought to the table. Right. Potentially we have Pat Cipollone talk about new things. And were you surprised, just quickly, were you surprised that they didn't have cooperation for much of what she said right there in that hearing? Uh, I was, but then at the same time I wasn't. I, it, my view was they're rolling her out She's the main witness. They're not going to, they're going to leave till other days to shore up and bring out other things. I think they're doing what they're doing very methodically uh, in a very strategic way. So I found it actually made sense that you didn't want to distract from her riveting explosive testimony by having other testimony in there. All right. Former federal prosecutor and ABC News contributor, Khan Nowaday, thank you so much. Appreciate the expertise. Thank you.
We turn now to the White House tonight, responding to the pressure campaign to gain WNBA star Brittany Griner's release from Russia. Let's bring in Rachel Scott, who is at the White House for us tonight. Rachel, President Biden and Vice President Harris spoke with Griner's wife, Sherelle, today. What have we learned about that conversation? Well, Phil, the White House says that they wanted to assure Brittany Griner's family that they are doing everything that they can to make sure that she comes home as quickly as possible. But important to note here, this came after immense pressure from Griner's family, including her wife, who directly called on the White House to schedule a meeting between her and President Biden. And then you had Brittany Griner herself. She wrote this very personal handwritten letter directly to the president. She says that she's terrified that she may never leave Russia and return home. We know that the president does plan to respond directly to Brittany Griner with a letter of his own, and he has been receiving daily updates on her situation. But Brittany Griner is not the only American that the Biden administration believes is being wrongfully detained in Russia. In fact, you also have Paul Whelan, a former Marine who was there, and tonight his family is growing increasingly frustrated. They say that he has written hundreds of letters to administration officials, and after more than three years, they are still waiting for a call from the president, Phil. All right, Rachel Scott, thank you. And overseas tonight, Ukrainian forces are now armed with new weapons from the U.S. as Ukraine puts long-range rockets onto the battlefield capable of hitting targets more than 40 miles away. Our cameras got a close-up look at the rockets being deployed. Here's ABC's James Longman in Ukraine. Tonight. A rare frontline look at the powerful American weapons Ukraine is unleashing against Russian forces. These are the rockets being loaded onto the U.S. HIMARS high mobility artillery rocket systems. These are the weapons that Ukraine says are making all the difference in its war for the very simple reason that they fire further than anything Ukraine currently has in its artillery. The other important detail is that they're truck mounted, which means once they're fired, these guys can move. The GPS-guided rockets can accurately hit targets over 40 miles away. We can use them to find targets in Russian-controlled territory that no other weapon can get to, this HIMAR commander tells me. We've hit command centers and ammunition stores. Video circulating online shows this massive blast at a Russian ammo dump deep in Donetsk, which Ukrainian officials say they hit Sunday. Russian officials confirmed U.S.-provided HIMARS were used in the attack. The launchers are capable of firing six rockets at a time. Four of these systems are in Ukraine now, with four more on the way, and they could have a significant impact on Russia's next offensive. And Phil, tonight, Western officials have told ABC News they're not sure that Russia will be able to take the rest of the Donbass region by the end of the year. The Ukrainians will be hoping that those U.S. HIMARS will stop them from taking it altogether. Phil. James Longman in Ukraine. James, thank you. Now to a one-on-one -on -one interview with the sister of Jalen Walker. Jalen was killed in a hail of bullets fired by Akron police officers. All of it captured on body cam video. Video that is disturbing and it's raising serious questions, setting off protests and calls for accountability. ABC's TJ Holmes spoke with Jalen's sister who told him the video is too painful for her to watch. I won't see him again. I won't be able to hug him again or just remind him that I love him or anything like that. Jada Walker is preparing to bury her baby brother. Speaking to ABC News for the first time since Akron police released body camera video showing eight of their officers shooting and killing 25-year-old Jalen Walker. Now, you know that video is out there. Are you just not ready to see it yet? It's just not matching the person that I know because he's not into that. And that's not him. That's not Jalen. And I can't accept that at all, and I don't, I shouldn't say I don't want to, but I just can't fathom to see any sort of video of him being gunned down that amount of times, you know, as if he was just, just like aim practice. The footage shows what authorities describe as a routine traffic stop, followed by a car chase, then foot chase. As Walker runs away, officers claim at one point he turns towards them prompting a hail of gunfire. A preliminary medical examiner report shows over 60 wounds to Walker's body, despite being unarmed at the moment he was killed. But police say Walker fired at them during the car chase and point to this image, which they say shows a flash of a gun from the driver's side of Walker's car, adding that they recovered this gun and a loaded magazine inside of his car. 
the way in which that picture um, depicted where the gun was located and the way in the manner in which it was placed, officers are approaching the car on their body-worn camera and it's capturing it in, in, as they are approaching. You are not, um, sounds like you're not buying, but also you don't see evidence that a gun was ever fired from that vehicle. I've never known him to own a gun of any sort at all. He never brought it to my attention. The last thing I would have imagined him having with him is a gun. I don't see clear evidence of a gun being fired. More importantly, the gun was recovered in the back seat, according to the preliminary autopsy report that my team reviewed. So I need to know how the gun got in the front seat. All nice presented with the ring and the car, you know, the, 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 um, the cartridge pulled out and the bullets there. It, this looked like a staged picture. ABC News has reached out to the Attorney General's office regarding the photo, but have not heard back. The family says police are creating a narrative that makes Walker out to be someone that he wasn't. I really haven't been watching a lot of television or publications on things because I just, I don't want to see him in that light. I'm just really sad because, like I said, out of many black men who, who have been killed and many families who experience this, even as a sister, you know, it's just... <sighs> Excuse me, it's just, it's really hard. Black Lives they Matter here. Walker's death ignited protests. No justice, no peace. As an outraged community and grieving family await answers from the investigation now underway. We still have yet to get a solid answer as to how, uh, like you said, a person who doesn't have any record, at the most will have a speeding ticket, you know, from using his car to get around, for me to have to experience that and see my family, you know, mourn, even my mom, you know, it really hurts. Our thanks to TJ for that. Now to the severe storms from Montana to the East Coast, bringing damaging winds, large hail, possible tornadoes, plus more than a dozen states under dangerous heat alerts as temperatures soar into the triple digits. ABC's meteorologist Ginger Z tracking it all for us. Ginger. Hey there, Phil. You know, I got to start you out with a look at what's been happening just today. You've got Ohio with one of the two reported tornadoes and really incredible drone video already coming in from the damage. They'll have to get out and survey this to see exactly what was happening there. I actually have my team back there at the office look up how we're doing tornado wise because March was incredible. We had a record number of tornadoes and just to catch everybody up, it's been a really busy start, even though some of the months are less than in the first five, six months of this year, we are flirting with top 10 in tornado numbers. So let's talk about what else we have to look out tonight. The stationary front that you see placed, it's kind of draped right there in the center of the nation. Well, that thing's going to help kick off more storms and it's not going to move much. That's what we have to know in a stationary front is it's stationary, right? So you see tonight the damaging wind possibilities, the severe thunderstorms from Western Virginia through Raleigh. So that includes the triangle back to Charlotte, Greenville, Columbia, and even West Virginia. That same area has to look out tomorrow because you have the same setup. The dynamics of the atmosphere don't move a whole lot. Like usually we see this kind of west to east, very progressive type of event. Not with this one. There's also a northern plains, northern Rockies in Great Falls. You can see back in that yellow pocket. Part of why this is sticking around like this and part of why people are being hot for more than just one day and seeing warnings is people say, oh, come on, it's just summer. Well, when you have excessive heat on the order of feeling like 110 in Memphis tomorrow for an afternoon, then in the overnight, you don't recover. You don't get down below 70. Sometimes you stay with the heat index up in the 80s. That does not allow a body to evaporate or to, to allow any cooling. And that's when we start to see what would be uncomfortable turn to potential danger. And that's what we'll be looking out for for those heat advisories through the rest of the re week, really, all the way over to the East Coast. Bill? Lots of air conditioning. All right, Ginger, thanks so much. Mm. Thank you. And when we come back, the dramatic rescue police pulling someone from a car with seconds to spare. A verdict tonight in the trial over the death of Nipsey Hussle. But up next, the major error by an American city that resulted in thousands of foreclosures. We are on the ground in Detroit to hear from the homeowners who say the American dream was taken from them because of a tax mistake.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back and take a look at this tense scene in Connecticut after a woman was hit by a bus and then pinned underneath it. Take a look at that. She was trapped under one of the bus's axles, but firefighters rushed over there, worked quickly to lift the bus and free the woman. She was rushed to a nearby hospital, amazingly, with no broken bones. Next to the fight for compensation in Detroit after thousands lost their homes due to an erroneous tax bill, the city has acknowledged the mistake but says it can't pay them back. ABC's Trevor Alt traveled there and files this report. How does it feel to be back in the neighborhood? It's a little unsettling. There's trauma here for me. It was here, just a few blocks south of 8 Mile in northeastern Detroit, that Sonia Bonnet and her family spent years building their lives. I can look at my old house and, you know, see my kids running around the yard. It wasn't perfect, but it was home. It's not anymore. Now I look at it and it's, it just, it holds nothing for me. Sonia and her family entered a contract here in 2011, making monthly payments to eventually become owners. Those payments were supposed to cover property tax, but city records show multiple years of unpaid property taxes. One day I get a letter in the mail that says there's a $5,000 tax debt. The owners then quickly transferred ownership to Sonia, meaning all those unpaid taxes fell to her family. City records show the unpaid 2012 and 2013 taxes owed on Sonia's home added up to just under $5,000. But a major 2020 investigation by the Detroit News estimated residents like Sonia were overtaxed by $600 million from 2010 through 2016. Based on their estimates, Sonia's former home was overtaxed by more than $1,500 in 2012 and 2013. 
And Sonia and her husband could never afford to pay those taxes back. And in 2017, the couple and their seven children were forced out. Do you think if it had been properly valued, you would have been able to afford to stay in your home? I think that if it had been properly valued, I'd have definitely been able to stay in the home because that tax bill that came wouldn't have been $5,000. It'd have either been something affordable, something I could have borrowed, something I could have negotiated, something feasible. From 2011 to 2015, a staggering one in four Detroit homes like Sonia's went into foreclosure because of failure to pay property taxes. But what the city now freely admits is that many of those homes were illegally overvalued by the city. 2010, 2011, 2012, possibly 13 were overvalued. Alvin Horn is the deputy CFO and chief assessor for the city of Detroit. He showed us the assessed value of Sonia's home in 2011 was $22,838. When that property was reassessed in 2017, it fell to just $10,400, less than half of what it was before, but Sonia had already lost the house. There is no question the city lost control of his assessment role. The assessment process wasn't keeping up with market downfall, so as prices fell, the assessments did not. Horn says at the time, the city didn't have the resources for a much needed citywide reappraisal and the problem spiraled out of control, especially as the city filed for bankruptcy in 2013 with $18 billion in debt. The city was having trouble keeping public safety officers on the streets and first responders. So there was no 10, 12, 15 million dollars to give to the assessor to do a reappraisal of the city. In 2014, Detroit began a state-mandated parcel-by-parcel reappraisal of its homes, which it completed by 2017. Horn says the city has placed a new focus on transparency and trust. He encourages every resident to file an appeal of their assessment so they can get it right. There's 400,000 properties in the city of Detroit, over 200,000 houses. I would never tell anyone that every single one of them is valued correctly. But that's why we have a review. Michigan State Constitution says a property cannot be assessed at more than 50% of its market value. Dr. Bernadetta Tuahene says her research found from 2009 to 2015, 53 to 84% of Detroit homes were assessed in violation of that rule. We find that the burden of these illegally inflated property taxes is being borne on the most vulnerable homeowners, the ones in the lowest valued homes. And she and some other housing advocates say the problem still isn't fixed. A 2020 University of Chicago study found while fewer Detroit homes were being assessed in violation of the Constitution, the city's lower valued homes were still being overassessed. But the city tells us that's not happening. Some people say that overassessments are still happening. Are they wrong? Yes. There are no systemic overassessments in this city. If I were to tell you that 95% of the assessment roll is correct, that's still 5% of, that's still 20,000 parcels. Mm -hmm. That could possibly be. Um, overvalued. Over assessed property taxes are not unique to Detroit. Studies have found property tax rates are 10 to 13 percent higher for black and Hispanic residents nationally. In recent years, investigative reports have uncovered disproportionate assessments in Cook County, Illinois, and in Philadelphia as well. Detroit is just ground zero for a national problem. But we see these inflated property taxes. It's a national racial justice issue that our country has yet to come to, to tackle with. And while Detroit acknowledges the overassessment problems from years past, acknowledgement doesn't make those aggrieved homeowners whole. From their perspective, the city stole from them and they need more than an apology. They want their money back. But the city says it's not quite that simple. The city does not have the money to hand people cash. It's against state law. And the city's not going to do anything that could bring the FRC back and control city finances. In 2020, the city proposed a plan offering benefits for homeowners affected between 2010 and 2013, including discounts for properties owned by the Detroit Land Bank Authority and priority access to affordable housing and city jobs. But the plan was voted down by Detroit City Council, with critics saying it didn't go far enough. Residents like Sonia say if the city admits it was wrong, they have an obligation to make it right. I want the world to take a look at what's going on here. When you talk to Detroiters who went through this, we want our money back. Because even when you think, okay, I'll accept the thing that they're offering, 
it's still that thing in you that's like, they stole from me. Why am I just accepting whatever they can give me? Trevor Alt, thank you for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the daring new mission to save the rhino before it becomes extinct. Actress Hayden Penetier speaking out for the first time in years about her battle with alcoholism and co-parenting while her child is living in Ukraine. And the Gen Z moviegoers who are making the movie Minions a box office hit while at the same time creating some headaches for theater operators. We'll take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, the White House statement confirming the president and vice president spoke earlier with the wife of Brittany Griner. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series streaming free on ABC News Live. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. Gen Z moviegoers are making a summer children's movie a box office hit and some say a nightmare for theater operators. We're looking at the gentle minions phenom by the numbers. $125 million, that's how much minions the rise of Gru made in U.S. box office sales. It's the most money ever brought in for a July 4th holiday opening. Internationally, another $93.8 million in box office sales opening weekend. In eight markets, the movie set the record for biggest opening weekend by an animated film ever. The fifth movie in the popular Despicable Me franchise may owe some of its blockbuster success to a TikTok meme. Teens, ironically costumed in suits, are going bananas for the children's movie. About 34% of U.S. viewers were between the ages of 13 and 17. Compare that to 8% for the franchise's last movie. They call themselves Gentle Minions, and the hashtag has amassed more than 7 million views. Throngs of young men dressed in suits cheering throughout the movie and mimicking the character Gru's mannerisms and speech. One of the earliest TikTok videos has racked up more than 35 million views. Suits at an animated movie is the latest incarnation of the meme trend, dressing in the opposite attire expected for the occasion. Some say the trend 
is despicable. One theater in the UK refunded 1,300 pounds to moviegoers, disturbed by the rowdy suit-wearing fans. Other theaters are just banning the outfit altogether. But most of the gentle minions seem to be keeping their minion mania under control. Universal Studios tweeted to everyone showing up in minions, two minions in suits, we see you and we love you. So a shout out to the movie's dedicated and perhaps unexpected following. We still have a lot to get to here on Prime. An update on the condition of legendary rocker Carlos Santana after he collapsed on stage. And our conversation with Cristela Alonso, the first Latina to ever create, produce, and star in a network sitcom. She now has a new project. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. The suspected gunman who police say opened fire on parade goers during the July 4th celebration in Highland Park, Illinois, appearing before a judge. The judge found that uh, the evidence was at such a level that he could be held without bond. Robert E. Cremo III faces seven first-degree murder charges in an attack that authorities say he planned for weeks, even down to his disguise, where according to investigators, he dressed in women's clothing to escape. Investigators do believe he did this to conceal his facial tattoos and his identity and help him during the escape. As police work to uncover a motive, growing questions about missed red flags. Illinois police say the suspect passed four background checks in 2020 and 2021, despite two prior police incidents in 2019 when he threatened to take his own life and then that September when police say they confiscated knives after family members accused him of threatening to kill people. A guilty verdict in the murder of rapper Nipsey Hussle. A jury convicted Eric Holder of first-degree murder. Nipsey Hussle was shot three times three years ago near his clothing store in Los Angeles. Prosecutors say Holder was enraged because he thought that Hussle had called him a snitch. Holder was acquitted of attempted murder against two men injured in the same attack. 
3 Ridgefield Park police officers risking their own lives to rescue a man from a burning car. Body cam footage shows the moment police arrived, smashed the window, and pulled the driver out just in time. It happened over the weekend. The driver noticed his car was smoking and pulled over, but in a matter of seconds, a fire broke out. That fire shut down the electronics in the car, and he was unable to unlock the car at all or even lower the windows. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. A federal appeals court will hear some arguments about whether the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, known as DACA, is legal. DACA protects people who were brought to the U.S. illegally as children from deportation. Immigration officials say there are more than 611,000 of these so-called dreamers in the U.S. Texas and several other states sued, claiming DACA placed a burden on states. But they also say former President Obama's creation of DACA was an executive outreach. Last July, a Texas judge ruled DACA was unlawful and block the approval of new applicants. Some scary moments for guitar legend Carlos Santana. He collapsed during a concert in Michigan last night. This is video from social media showing crews surrounding him on stage. A spokesperson says Santana was overtaken by heat exhaustion and dehydration. Somebody at the concert says he was about four or five songs into his set when he sat in front of the drums and then collapsed backwards. He was taken from the concert venue to the hospital where his manager says he is recovering well. Hayden Panettiere is ready to jump back into the spotlight for the first time in four years. The movie and TV star battled postpartum depression following the birth of her daughter in 2014, now sharing how deep her challenges really were. Where did you turn to for support? Um, the bottle, the bottom of a bottle. I didn't have any negative feelings towards my child. I just knew I was deeply depressed and I didn't know where, you know, the alcoholism was ending and postpartum was beginning and and I ran myself pretty ragged. Hayden's seven-year-old daughter with former professional boxing legend Vladimir Klitschko calls Ukraine home. And you took action. And I took action. So I created Hoplon International to make sure that every dollar that people donate goes to med kits, protective gear, helmets, and you know, blood for the people who are on the front lines. Klitschko sharing this video from Ukraine. Thank you for the med kits and the bulletproof vests. They're gonna save our lives. Kaylee Hartong, thank you. Now to a scathing report on the police response to that deadly shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Investigators say authorities had several chances to stop the massacre before it even started, including an officer armed with a rifle reportedly having the gunman in his sights before he entered the school, but waited for permission to shoot. ABC's John Quinones with the details. Tonight, a chilling new report detailing how Uvalde police missed chances to stop the suspect in the massacre at Robb Elementary School. More kids running out. They're breaking windows. According to the 24-page assessment commissioned by the Texas Department of Public Safety, a Uvalde police officer on the scene where the suspect crashed his vehicle saw the armed suspect outside the school but paused. Guy with a rifle. The report saying the officer, armed with a rifle, asked his supervisor for permission to shoot the suspect. However, the supervisor either didn't hear or responded too late. Adding, in this instance, the UPD officer would have heard gunshots and or reports of gunshots. And a reasonable officer would conclude in this case, based on the totality of the circumstances, that use of deadly force was warranted. When the officer looked back at the suspect, he was entering the building. The report saying another responding officer did not see the shooter in the parking lot because he was driving at a high rate of speed. Room 12, is there anybody inside of the building? Tunnel is advising he is in the room full of victims. 24 seconds after entering the school, the suspect began firing into classrooms 11 and 12, killing 19 children and two teachers. John Quinones, thank you. Next tonight, a Texas mother in agony, ple agony pleading with the public to help capture the suspect in a road rage shooting that left her five-year-old dead. When I failed to protect my baby, the police have their duty to protect and serve the country. As a mom, I have a duty to protect and serve my kids. It's, it's heartbreaking that we live in a world 
you can't send your kids to school without potentially a, a gunman coming in. You can't send your kids to church or even go to church and know that you're going to make it home. But my kids aren't safe in my vehicle with me. I just want my baby home with me. And my baby's sitting in the hospital by herself. The child was killed shortly after his mother picked him and his eight-year-old brother up, uh, who was also shot from, from daycare. They picked him up. She picked him up from daycare. They were on their way to get ice cream when a car pulled up next to them and opened fire. Now to a unique effort underway in southern Africa to try to save the endangered rhino population. Uh, long under threat from poachers, a group has come up with a way to relocate rhinos to a safer home, bringing them back to Mozambique, where they had been extinct for four decades, and where the hope is to populate once again, to grow and thrive. And the effort is already paying dividends. Here's ABC's Lama Hassan. <laughs> They are some of nature's most majestic creatures, roaming the plains of Asia and Africa for centuries. But years of brutal conflicts and illegal poaching at a staggering rate have all but wiped out the world's rhino population, which is down 97.6% since 1960. Every 12 hours, one rhino is poached for their prized horns, a symbol of status for some. Watch out, watch out, watch, watch out, out, watch, watch. That's why the work by the Peace Parks Foundation is so critical in protecting the species. The men holding the guns in Limpopo province in South Africa aren't here to hurt the rhinos, they're here to save them. For the first time, the group is translocating 19 white rhinos from South Africa to their new home in Zanabe National Park in Mozambique, in the hopes of building up a new rhino population in a safer space. The rhinos are shot with a tranquilizer, then hauled into these large containers to take them to their new home in Mozambique. We all know what the situation is with rhino security. So we've got an armed convoy that travels with us to make sure that we get safely to the border post and then in Mozambique side they've got another armed convoy taking over from us. They then make the arduous journey by truck alongside an anti-poaching unit. Anti-poaching units, unfortunately, these days have become almost paramilitary. They need to have the same kind of discipline as a soldier has. Once they've arrived, the rhinos are released into this sanctuary in Mozambique, built with maximum security to ward off poachers. 72 highly trained rangers deployed to guard the rhinos. One, two. 20 more guards on patrol for first-line detection of incursions, a rapid response unit ready to go from the air. We have to start thinking about stuff that we haven't done to date, because what we've done to date hasn't worked as well as we hoped. This project so far has been hailed as a success, and the goal is over the next two to three years, they'll be able to move more than 40 rhinos to the park, with the hope of creating a thriving rhino population in the next decade. And it's already taking shape. The first healthy female rhino calf was born in Zanave National Park just a couple of weeks ago. We need to get more populations breeding in safe areas all over Africa. And that's what we're trying to achieve with this project. What an effort. Lama Hassan, thank you. Cristela Alonso is a boundaries-breaking, proud South Texan. She is a comedian and was the first Latina to create, produce, and star in her own network sitcom, Cristela, on ABC. And after a break, she's back with her Netflix stand-up special, Middle Classy, where she makes light of a lot of darkness. Check it out. You know that saying, money can't buy you happiness? That's poor people saying it. <laughs> Let me tell you, money bought me happiness. When I got money, I went to therapy. I found out I had anxiety and depression. <laughs> Christella joins us now. Christella, so great to have you with us. We really do appreciate you taking the time. You start the hour by driving with civil rights icon Dolores Huerta, who is going on and on about her never-ending fight, and you actually tell her, hang on a second, I gotta go. So you leave 92-year-old Dolores Huerta in a car by herself. Why was it so important for you to have her set the tone for this particular special? 
I did that because, you know, I took a break from stand-up for a bit to really kind of focus on, on issues that were affecting my community. And within those years, I really forged a, a really close relationship with Dolores Huerta. And when I started thinking about the new special, I really wanted to take accountability, accountability into where I am in life right now. And I thought, you know, First of all, A, Dolores Huerta is a household name that should be more recognized and more celebrated. I wanted to show people that you can do stand-up and you can be active in the community and they can forge together and actually make sense and entertain while educating. Um, you're talking about that six-year gap from your first Netflix special, Lower Classy, to now Middle Classy. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest transformation for you uh, that you experienced personally uh, during this time? And did any of it influence your comedy? You know, to me, I think that as I get older, I realize that uh, the obstacles and sacrifices, the struggles that I've had growing up really make you who you are. When I look back, especially in, the, in that six-year gap, I started meeting people that made me realize that while my story might be unique in Hollywood, per se, it's actually very common in the community. And you want people to understand that while you're being specific about your stories, you're so universal because so many of us have those same struggles. Do hit on very real topics as you're talking about. Uh, things like growing up low income, self-care, the pressures of first generation kids face. Uh, I wanna play a clip for you to listen to, obviously you know it, that sums up a part of that experience. By the time I was eight, I was helping my family pay for bills and stuff, you know? Translating everything for them, translating medication, hoping I don't kill them, right? <laughs> Like, no, drink dos, don't die. I'd be at school freaking out. Did I say one or dos? I don't know. I'm like drinking slamming milks like it's beer. All the other girls are like, hey, you want to play house? I'm like, I live house. Get the out of here. Like, that's me. Yeah, very real different concerns that kids have when they're first generation. Everybody's experience, especially first generation kids, is different, but they're all our experiences. Yeah, I think that there's also an assumption that with age comes this uh, this knowledge that you know you have access to all of these things and you know you know how to use them and you know what to do. And for me, I I wanted to be very honest and tell people I didn't know. I I didn't I didn't go to the doctor growing up. I didn't I couldn't you know I, I couldn't do a lot of things that now I'm finally able to do because I've reached a certain level economically where I'm allowed to indulge in things that should be necessities. So for me, I think that being honest about it and really kind of letting everybody know I'm figuring it out and I know that I'm not the only one, it's okay to not know. The LA Times had an article about you titled, uh, Cristela Alonso is ready for a comeback. Is Hollywood ready for her? Um, my question to you in 2022 is, does it matter if Hollywood is ready for you or not? What are we expecting from you next? No, you know, I realized that when you have stories to say, uh, to tell, when you have a voice that you want to use, there will always be a way to get it through to people, especially in 2022. So for me, I just like to tell people I'm back. If you want the stories, come and talk to me. Let's see what we can do. But also, this is my journey, and you're going to be a part of it whether you like it or not. Uh, Cristela Alonso, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Middle Classy on Netflix. It's super funny. Thank you. <laughs> Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at this green sky. It was pictured in South Dakota just before a powerful derecho storm with winds near 100 miles per hour. They swept through. The storm caused the sky to literally turn green. Green skies before or after a storm, according to the Weather Service, can be an indicator of hail. That's our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. And thanks for streaming with us. Hey, coming up in the next hour, more on what we are learning about the events leading up to that horrific July 4th rampage and the possible future of DACA, the legal arguments both for and against it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is, that is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Phil Lipoff, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A guilty verdict in the fatal shooting of rapper Nip Nipsey Hussle. Eric Holder was convicted of first-degree murder, two counts of attempted voluntary manslaughter and possession of a firearm. He was found not guilty of attempted murder against two men who were wounded in the 2019 shooting attack. The state of Texas's Operation Lone Star is being probed by a federal civil rights investigation by the Justice Department, according to a letter obtained by ABC News. Operation Lone Star, Texas Department of Public Safety program, targets migrants coming across the U.S.-Mexico -Mex border and was put into place by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. The DOJ is seeking information to see if DPS is in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. A Texas DPS spokesperson says DPS is complying with all federal civil rights inquiries. The Justice Department says not only is DPS a recipient of DOJ funds, it also is a recipient of DHS funding as well. After more than a decade of abortion-related search terms being unavailable on Defense Department computer networks, the Pentagon reversed its deep-rooted digital blockade around the subject. The decision comes after the Supreme Court's ruling to overturn Roe v. Wade and increasing concern from service members looking to understand what reproductive health care options are now available to them. U.S. defense official told ABC News that abortion-related content on DOD networks was originally blocked by a 2010 policy. Abortion-related search terms would lead users to a page at that time, notifying them uh, that they were attempting to access a blocked website. We have new details tonight about the mass shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, and the suspect charged with seven counts now of murder in the 4th of July parade massacre. The 21-year-old appeared in court today, uh, showing little emotion as the names of the victims were read aloud. Officials revealing that the alleged gunman was actually considering a second attack that day in neighboring Wisconsin following his escape from the parade scene. ABC's Alex Perez in Highland Park for us tonight. Today, before a judge, accused 4th of July killer Robert Cremo denied bail. Prosecutors say he has confessed to the horrific crime. His statement was voluntary. He went into details about what he had done. Uh, he admitted to what he had done. They say Cremo, dressed in women's clothes, covered his distinctive facial tattoos with makeup and climbed a fire escape to the perch where he used an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle to rain down terror on his innocent victims. Amid the chaos, police say Cremo fled to neighboring Wisconsin, where they say he considered launching a second attack there on a celebration he drove by. It appears when he drove to Madison, he did see a celebration that was occurring in Madison, uh, and he seriously contemplated using the firearm he had in his vehicle to commit another shooting. Do you know how much ammunition he had at that point? On a, approximately 60 rounds. 
But according to police, Cremo abandoned the idea, believing he didn't have time to plan it. <laughs> Investigators have determined he spent weeks mapping out the attack on the parade in Highland Park, but his motive still a mystery. His motivation isn't uh, necessarily clear. However, he uh, had some type of affinity towards the number four and seven, and inverse was seven four. Seven four, July 4th. What authorities say they do know is that Cremo was armed to the teeth. And tonight, they are grappling with serious questions about how he was able to obtain his weapons legally, given a series of red flags over the years. Police called to his home twice in 2019, once after they say he attempted suicide, and again five months later, after they say he threatened to kill his family, authorities confiscating a stash of more than a dozen knives, a dagger, and a sword. But none of that stopped Cremo from passing multiple background checks to legally purchasing a total of five firearms. For most of those purchases, he was under 21, which means he needed a parent to sign off on his firearm owner's ID, and state police say that's exactly what his father did. Alex, thank you. And we continue to hear heartbreaking stories emerging about the seven victims killed on the 4th of July, including the parents of a two-year-old boy. His father was killed as he shielded his son from a barrage of bullets. The boy was rescued by strangers. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, as the close-knit community of Highland Park mourns and plans funerals for the seven killed on the 4th of July, we're learning more about the people who lost their lives and how strangers came together in the chaos to help a little boy. In the aftermath of the shooting, Dana and Gregory Ring, sheltering in a parking garage, approached by a woman covered in blood. She was carrying a child who was also covered in blood, and it quickly became apparent the child was not her own. That child was two-year-old Aiden McCarthy. Aiden's parents, Kevin and Arena McCarthy, did not survive. That woman who found Aiden underneath his dying father was Lauren Silva. He had blood on his legs. He had a sock that was fully covered in blood that I wanted off of him. Um, he had one shoe on. What was Aiden like? Uh, Aiden, when I took Aiden down to the garage, um, he wasn't crying. He just kept saying, is Mama Dada okay? Um, and it was hard to, to look at him in the face and say it's going to be okay when I didn't know if it was. Lauren gave Aiden to the rings, who brought Aiden to police. I pulled up and I said, this is not arcade. It's not his blood. He's okay. What should we do? And a cop said, we can't be babysitters now. Can you take care of him? We said, of course. Tonight, Aiden is safe with his grandparents. The Rings, thankful they were able to help Aiden and Lauren. She's, she's a real hero. She's a she hero. She's out of the immediate danger. It's a time when strangers come together and you just, you just do, you just act. And um, they were doing the same thing that I was doing. The heartbreaking story. Stephanie, thank you. Now to the January 6th committee and new developments on a major witness. Former President Trump's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, will now testify under a subpoena on Friday, meeting with the panel behind closed doors. He is a critical witness who was with the president in the West Wing as the attack on the U.S. Capitol unfolded. Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. He was the top lawyer in the Trump White House, one of the few people around the former president as the insurrection unfolded. And tonight, Pat Cipollone has agreed to testify before the House committee investigating the riot. Our committee is certain that Donald Trump does not want Mr. Cipollone to testify here. But we think the American people deserve to hear from Mr. Cipollone personally. Faced with a congressional subpoena and weeks of public pressure, Cipollone has agreed to a videotaped, transcribed interview with the committee behind closed doors on Friday. Several witnesses already describing his actions that fateful day, including former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson, who said Cipollone tried to stop the president from going to the Capitol and was angry when former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows appeared to do nothing as rioters chanted, Hang Mike Pence. Hang Mike Pence! Hang Mike Pence! I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. Hang Mike Pence! They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat, he thinks Mike deserves it, he doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. To which Pat said something, this is effing crazy. We'll be watching Friday, Pierre, thank you. 
Today, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans held a hearing on the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, but didn't provide a, a really clear decision or timeline on the legality of the Obama-era program that shields young people brought to this country by their parents from deportation. Joining me now is someone who was in that court today on behalf of DACA recipients, the Acting Attorney General of New Jersey, Matthew Platkin. Sir, thank you so much for taking the time after what must have been a very long day. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Right, first off, what was your general impression of how today's hearing went? Look, I think uh, the attorneys did a phenomenal job, both for the state of New Jersey, the Department of Justice, and MALDEF, to stand up on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of DACA recipients who are part of the fabric of this country. It's a legal program. It's based on precedent that's been around for decades. And it's a program that has not only helped the individuals who've received the DACA awards, but the communities they live and the states that they live, like New Jersey. Your state solicitor general argued that a sudden end to the program would bring this nation, uh, quote, saying the movement there is, is, is a final judgment and we would have an individual serving in the armed forces, this is a quote, uh, who's a DACA recipient on Monday who no longer could be able to serve there on a Tuesday. It's that sort of disruption uh, that a post-enforcement challenge like this can engender, and that's the sort of challenge that he thinks the, the district court nowhere grappled with in its order. So there's obviously a very real chance that DACA could be overturned. New Jersey is home to 16,000 DACA grantees. That's according to your website. Is there a plan? What is the plan if the federal government doesn't side with you here? Look, as you said, these DACA recipients, 16,000 New Jersey, hundreds of thousands across the country. They've relied on this program for over a decade. They've relied on this program to work, to travel, and to become part of the fabric of America, a country that's really all they've ever known. There's over 250,000 children whose parents are DACA recipients. So the extent to which people have relied on this program is extraordinary. And what Texas is asking for, years after the program came into effect, to strike it down and vacate it overnight is an extraordinary remedy. So the plan simply is we're going to keep fighting for DACA and we're going to keep fighting for our dreamers. There is a possibility that this case is, is ultimately decided by the Supreme Court based on their recent interpretation, say, on the, the Remain in Mexico policy, which they allowed the Biden administration to end. Is there any kind of clue there as to which way they'll go on DACA? Look, I'll let um, the argument speak for itself. And if we get to that point, we'll certainly make the case to the Supreme Court. But what I'll say very clearly is that this is a program that has clear legal precedent. And what the district court did, and not only sending this program back to the department, but vacating it and issuing a nationwide injunction is extraordinary. And it's an incredibly activist decision. How devastating will this be to the business owners you're talking about, the nurses that you're talking about, uh, so many people that this country relies on. How personally devastating will this be? It, it's incredibly devastating. I Just to take this interview, I left a lunch with several DACA recipients. Among them was the first Rhodes Scholar DACA recipient. And you think about that. The country, one of the best universities in England, was begging for him to come, and he had to wait until the Biden administration took office before he was able to accept that scholarship. And so you have Rhodes Scholars and doctors and business owners and ordinary people who only know this country. It's all they've ever known. Their parents here, they're raising children here. And so to say to them, oh, sorry, that that policy that we had in place that you relied on for a decade, well, you know, Texas doesn't like it, so we're going to throw it out. Mm -hmm. Your life's in disarray. And you go back to a country that you've never known. I can't stand by that. And for the 16,000 people in New Jersey who have relied on this program and who have become part of the fabric of our state, we're going to continue to fight for them. Acting Attorney General for New Jersey, Matthew Placken, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have the conversation with you. We appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. All right, now we're going to turn to a one-on-one -on -one interview with the sister of Jalen Walker. Jalen was killed in a hail of bullets fired by Akron police officers, all of it captured on body camera video, disturbing video raising serious questions and setting off protests and calls for accountability. ABC's TJ Holmes spoke with Jalen's sister, telling him it's far too painful to watch the video. I won't see him again. I won't be able to hug him again or just remind him that I love him or anything like that. Jada Walker is preparing to bury her baby brother. 
speaking to ABC News for the first time since Akron police released body camera video showing eight of their officers shooting and killing 25-year-old Jalen Walker. Now, you know that video is out there. Are you just not ready to see it yet? It's just not matching the person that I know because he's not into that. And that's not him. That's not Jalen. And I can't accept that at all. And I don't, I shouldn't say I don't want to, but I just can't fathom to see any sort of video of him being gunned down that amount of times, you know, as if he was just, just like aim practice. The footage shows what authorities describe as a routine traffic stop followed by a car chase, then foot chase. As Walker runs away, officers claim at one point he turns towards them, prompting a hail of gunfire. A preliminary medical examiner report shows over 60 wounds to Walker's body, despite being unarmed at the moment he was killed. But police say Walker fired at them during the car chase and point to this image, which they say shows a flash of a gun from the driver's side of Walker's car, adding that they recovered this gun and a loaded magazine inside of his car. The way in which that picture um, depicted where the gun was located and the way in the manner in which it was placed Officers are approaching the car on their body-worn camera, and it's capturing it in, in, as they are approaching. You are not, um, sounds like you're not buying, but also you don't see evidence that a gun was ever fired from that vehicle. I've never known him to own a gun of any sort at all. He never brought it to my attention. The last thing I would have imagined him having with him is a gun. I don't see clear evidence of a gun being fired. More importantly, the gun was recovered in the back seat, according to the preliminary autopsy report that my team reviewed. So I need to know how the gun got in the front seat. All nice presented with the ring and the, car, you know, the the the, um, the cartridge pulled out and the bullets there. It, this looked like a staged picture. ABC News has reached out to the Attorney General's office regarding the photo, but have not heard back. The family says police are creating a narrative that makes Walker out to be someone that he wasn't. I really haven't been watching a lot of television or publications on things because I just, I don't want to see him in that light. I'm just really sad because, like I said, out of many black men who, who have been killed and many families who experience this, even as a sister, you know, it's just... <sighs> Excuse me, it's just, it's really hard. Black lives, they matter here. Walker's death ignited protests. No justice, no peace. As an outraged community and grieving family await answers from the investigation now underway. We still have yet to get a solid answer as to how, uh, like you said, a person who doesn't have any record, at the most will have a speeding ticket, you know, from using his car to get around, for me to have to experience that and see my family, you know, mourn, even my mom, you know, it really hurts. Uh, thanks to TJ for that interview. A former Netflix reality show star has been sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. Jerry Harris, who appeared on the hit docuseries Cheer, was sentenced for soliciting sex from minors and pressuring young boys to send him nude photos and videos. The 22-year-old pleaded guilty in February to two charges for sexually assaulting a 15-year-old in the bathroom during a cheer competition and paying a 17-year-old to send him explicit photos and videos on Snapchat. Still to come tonight, could Britain's Boris Johnson soon be out of work? And is remote warfare moral? We're going to talk about it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. 
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. South Africa's president says the country has lost future doctors, lawyers, and law enforcement officials when 21 teenagers died under mysterious circumstances last month. The president spoke at the funeral for 19 of the 21 children who died in a tavern in the coastal town of East London. The exact cause of the deaths still not clear as investigators are still waiting for the outcome of toxicology results. Now, at the mass service, the president also disclosed that the last words of the youngest victim, who was just 13, were, Mama, I'm coming back. Boris Johnson stood his ground before the House of Commons on Wednesday as he faces yet more calls to resign after key allies deserted his government last night. Prime Minister vowed to carry on, but his position could soon become untenable as supporters continue to resign. Trinidad and Tobago's 4x100 meter team given the gold medal from the 2008 Beijing Olympics today. The medals were awarded following the disqualification of the Jamaican team, which included Usain Bolt. This happened after a separate Jamaican failed a doping test as a result of the IOC looking at frozen blood samples from the 2008 Games. There is a growing use of remotely operated vehicles during war, and it's raising ethical concerns about launching military strikes from halfway around the world. In his new book, Is Remote Warfare Moral? Weighing Issues of Life and Death from 7,000 Miles, United States Air Force Officer Joseph Chapa offers his unique perspective as someone who has both participated in remote warfare and studied military ethics of it. Officer Chapa, thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate it. Looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Phil. You focus your book on the humanity of the crew and pilots who operate remote aircraft. Why do you think these individuals are often overlooked when it comes to this category of warfare? Uh, that's a great question. Before we start, if you don't mind, although I'm a U.S. Air Force officer, the views I express here are my own and don't necessarily reflect the DOD. Understood. Uh, so, you know, if you look back at, at history, warfare has always been a deeply human exercise, and we can see that since antiquity. And there's always been this promise that the next technological development will sort of be able to allow us to distance ourselves from the ugliness of war. And that's been true in the last 20 years. We, we saw that promise again, that remote warfare would allow us to distance ourselves from the ugly costs of war. And that just hasn't been the case. And so there's human costs on both ends of these weapons. The people who are suffering the violence caused by these missiles, which sometimes are morally justified and legally permissible, but still we're doing terrible things to people on the other side of the world. But there's also humanity going on right there in the cockpit, the pilot sensor operator, the, the intel folks that are supporting that mission. They have to sort of live with the emotional costs of the violence that they cause. And so there's nothing about remote warfare that has allowed us to abstract from the humanity of war. Remote warfare is just as in, in, ingrained with this humanity as warfare always has been. Yeah, you see what we're, what we're looking at there is sort of like a joystick. A lot of people say, oh, it must be like playing a video game. But you write specifically that operating remote vehicles isn't like playing a video game at all. But the individuals controlling these vehicles can actually experience a, a different kind of trauma versus targeting an enemy in person. Uh, tell us about the mental toll it takes uh, targeting an, an enemy from there rather than, you know, from right on the battlefield. That's right. Early on in the first 10 years or so, beginning with the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, there were lots of comments out there in the literature that suggested that 
um, that these pilots and sensor operators would have this PlayStation mentality or this video game mentality. And then as we started to get insights, there were actual uh, psychological studies done on those crew members. Uh, it turns out it's anything but a video game. Those crews are deeply invested in the work that they're doing. Sometimes that's kinetic work. That's the work of blowing things up. Sometimes it's the work of watching for hours, maybe even days on end. Uh, as, as high value targets go about their, their daily lives, uh, waiting to gather additional information or additional intelligence. And so what we found is that the, the rates of, for instance, post-traumatic stress, they're not zero, so those crews can face symptoms of post-traumatic stress, but the odds that a predator or reaper crew member would suffer from post-traumatic stress are exactly the same as the odds that a traditional airman, say a fighter pilot or a bomber pilot, would suffer symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And so actually there's a lot of sort of continuation here of, of aerial warfare over the last 70 years that's continued right through, through remote warfare. So the psychological costs are real, but they're also not as dramatic as you might uh, as you might think if you, if you watch some of the movies come out of Hollywood, et cetera. Throughout the book, you refer to just war theory, an idea dating back to Aristotle. Really, it raises the question, is war discriminate, proportionate, and necessary? But some theorists believe remote warfare violates just war theory and should not be used. Now, this has been a discussion, as, as you know, the reason you wrote the book for, for years. What's your view on that? Should it be used? That's, um, so that's a, a good way to capture it. So in the first 10 years or so of the literature on the ethics of drones, if you like, uh, there, the initial arguments started to kind of form around, are they discriminate, are they proportionate? Uh, but the fact is these airplanes are releasing the same precision guided weapons that all of our other airplanes and, and helicopters are. So you really can't make the argument um, that these weapons are indiscriminate or disproportionate. And so in, in recent years, in the last five or 10 years, theorists have started to say, well, maybe, um, maybe it's not that they're indiscriminate, maybe the fact is that these crews shouldn't be considered combatants at all. And if they shouldn't be combatants at all, then maybe they shouldn't be able to avail themselves of the rules under just war theory. So maybe there's something wholesale wrong about this remote warfare thing. And I spend quite a, quite a bit of time in the book trying to address that. And ultimately what I come down to is that if we were to try to draw a line that says everything on this side of the line is traditional war and everything on this side of the line is, is new and technical and mediated by ones and zeros and long distance, we'd actually have a really hard time trying to figure out where that line is. And so I'm much more of the opinion that the way we should think about just war theory is that an act is permissible if the, the combatant under the crosshairs, if the person we're considering doing violence to, if they're, uh, if they're causing a threat. And so if they're causing a threat, then it shouldn't really matter as much to us whether we neutralize that threat with a, a soldier with an M16 or with an F-16 fighter jet or with an MQ-9 Reaper. Um, so I actually think remote warfare fits really, really nicely into the broader just war framework. But there are a lot of important questions there, and I hope that that discussion continues. Oh, yeah. I mean, war and ethics has been the conversation for years and will continue to be. You probably write three more books about it. Officer Joe Chapa, thank you so much for joining us. Joe's new book is Remote Warfare Moral, Weighing Issues of Life and Death from 7,000 Miles is available now wherever books are sold. And still to come, the teenager and the act of bravery that is being credited with saving lives. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
Finally tonight, an act of bravery from a teenager in Mississippi. He leapt into action after three teenage girls drove off a boat launch and were beginning to sink. A responding officer was struggling to save them. Reporter Amber Spradley from our partner station, WLOX, has the story tonight in our local lowdown. A holiday weekend hangout under the I-10 bridge quickly turned to terror when three teenage girls drove right into the Pascagoula River. They drove straight under the water, like only a little bit of the car was still above the water. 16-year-old Corian Evans from Pascagoula tossed his shoes, shirt, phone, and jumped in. I was just like, I can't let none of these foes die. Then they get out the water. So I just started getting them. I wouldn't even think about nothing else. Evans, a Pascagoula High student, says he's been swimming since he was about three. He was at the right place at the right time with the right skills. And I started helping both of them try to stay above from the back. Like, they were, I was behind them trying to keep them above water and swim with them at the same time. I'm glad nothing happened to him while he was trying to save other people's lives. I was really proud of Corian because he wasn't just thinking about himself. He was trying to really get all those people out the water. Marquita Evans now praising her son for helping rescue the three girls, along with Moss Point police officer Gary Mercer. I turn around, I see the police officer, he drowning. He going underwater drowning, saying help. So I went over there. I went and got the, I grabbed the police officer and I'm like swimming him back until I feel myself I can walk. Chief Brandon Ashley releasing this statement to WLOX saying in part, quote, we commend Evans's bravery. If he had not assisted, it could have turned tragic. They was out there throwing up because a lot of water had got inside all of them. One victim, Cora Watson, posting on social media, he saved my life right before my last breath. 25 yards up. So we, it was a lot of swimming. My legs were so tired after. Anything could have been in that water though, but I wouldn't think about it. A brave young man, Amber Spradley, thank you so much from our station WLOX. That's our show for tonight. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news. 